All right, so it is 12 o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started on time. Thanks everyone for, uh, for those of you who are here in person and for those watching on Zoom, it's good to see everybody. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds at the University of Colorado. We're really happy again to be back in person. Please join us in RC2, the second floor, Krugman Hall. I would love to fill this up and use Zoom only as a backup going forward. Uh, a little bit of a teaser for folks in the next couple of coming weeks. On September 6th, Dr. Dwayne Pearson from the Department or Division of Rheumatology is going to be speaking about his echo distance education platform and what it can be used to accomplish for practitioners in the community as well as for patients. And then on September 13th, we are first Department of Medicine Systems Improvement Conference of the Year. As a reminder, I'll say this again next week, System Improvement Conference is the only one that is all virtual. So on that day, please do not show up in the Improvement Conference Room because there will be no one here. Uh, happy to offer CME and MOC credit. We don't have the QR code up here this week, but please use the link that came out to you in your uh, email. And questions will come primarily from our live audience, but of course the chiefs, thank you for the chief medical residents, will monitor the Zoom Q&A and ask questions from those who are watching online. Uh, now I'm really very pleased to welcome today's speaker, speaker, Dr. Katie Dickinson. Dr. Dickinson is an associate professor of environmental and occupational health at the Colorado School of Public Health here on the Anschutz campus. She did her undergraduate work at Stanford University. Uh, her advanced training is extensive. She also got a master's in earth systems from Stanford while she was in Palo Alto. She then went to Duke where she got a PhD in environmental economics and policy. She was a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health and Society Scholar at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and was a postdoctoral fellow in advanced studies program here at the National Center of Atmospheric Research up in Boulder. Uh, Dr. Dickinson is a leader Leader in the intersection of climate and health, as well as in environmental justice, which is some of all of what we are going to hear about today. Uh, she teaches several courses in the School of Public Health focused on the effect of climate on health, as well as how to measure the impact of policy uh, and interventions on those outcomes. Her work is well funded by the National Science Foundation, NIOSH, USAID, as well as the Wellspring Foundation. It really is an honor today to have a speaker from our School of Public Health um, and to welcome Dr. Dickinson to Medical Grand Rounds. Thank you all very much. Um, it's great to be here from all the way over in the Fitzsimmons building. Um, that kind of commute is uh, hard to come by these days, so good to be over here. Um, I am going to talk to you today about some work that I've done collaborat collaboratively with community partners that focuses on environmental justice. And we're really gonna be focusing on this question of who bears the cost for all of the things that we enjoy as a society, the goods and services that we consume. And so I want you to take just a minute to think about these questions. When you think about environmental justice, what are the things that come to mind? And specifically, how do you feel like this concept, this principle relates to you personally, individually? What role do you play? What kind of relationship do you have with environmental justice communities? And we'll talk about what we mean by that. So actually I'm gonna have you dive into this a little bit more. I'm gonna have you take out your phones and scan this QR code. I'm not sure if it's possible to pull this um, thread and put it in the chat for the Zoom. For those of you who are on the Zoom, um, uh, either way, the QR code will work. So I'm gonna give you about five minutes to work through this quiz and then we'll go from there. All right, I'm gonna uh, continue. Go ahead and um, wrap up as, your, as, I, as I continue with the presentation. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, my definition for what environmental justice is, and we'll use that to explore this concept and how it relates to you. So environmental justice is a social and a political movement. It's an aspirational principle and it's a field of research. Um, the, the environmental justice started as a movement led by communities in Warren County, North Carolina, who are protesting the dumper, dumping of hazardous waste in their backyards. This prompted some research conducted by a black church in partner, partnership with academics, using data to document and verify the health impacts that they were, the, uh, what communi communities like Warren County suspected that communities of color across the United States were bearing a disproportionate burden when it came to uh, access or exposure to toxic waste siting in particular. This led to the development and codification of a principle that all people deserve to live in healthy environments and to have a say in the decisions that affect those environments. 
This principle has then fueled additional policy action and ongoing social movements, including the movement for uh, climate justice, which acknowledges the disproportionate burdens of climate change on low income and communities of color, as well as additional research um, that documents the extent of environmental injustices and also interrogates the social and political drivers of these injustices and builds partnership with communities to work towards a more, more just future. So when I talk about environmental justice as a movement, um, I really like to use this quote from the book From the Ground Up, which says that you know, there wasn't sort of a single starting point. It's more like a river that's been fed by multiple tributaries. And we really can't talk about that river without talking about where we are today. So we are taking, I am giving this talk from the ancestral lands of the Cheyenne, um, Arapaho and Sioux uh, people and the forced removal of indigenous people from their land and the centuries of ongoing resistance that have followed that and continue today are certainly one of the big tributaries to the environmental justice movement. In this century, some note that Martin Luther King Jr. had traveled to Memphis to support striking sanitation workers. Uh, I click this right spot here. Um, in Memphis when he was assassinated in 1969. Simultaneously work led by Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers um, in their struggle against pesticide exposure uh, were also in, in the 1960s also were feeding this movement. So what you see here is that from the beginning, environmental justice and workers' rights have been closely intertwined. Um, that's the Warren County protest that I mentioned before. Um, so spurred by these Warren, those Warren County protests that I talked about before, the first research efforts to document racial disparities in toxic waste siting began. The United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice, under the leadership of Reverend ben Benjamin Chavez, um, who had also stood with the protesters um, in Warren County, uh, published this toxic waste in the race in the United States in 1987. Um, this report um, that was also led by uh, Charles Lee, showed that race was the single most important factor in determining where toxic wastes were cited in the United States. It also found that due to str a strong statistical correlation between race and the location of hazardous, hazardous waste sites, the siting of these facilities in communities of color was no accident. This was a specific intentional result of local siting, um, local state and federal land use policies. Um, in 2007, a follow-up report looked at um, the same question, but with expanded methods using census data, and found that racial disparities were even greater than previously reported, and that people of color made up the majority of people living within three kilometers of toxic waste dumps. Um, these differences couldn't be explained, again, by socioeconomic status alone, um, but were very strongly correlated with race. So I'm gonna talk about redlining, which is one of the clearest policies that it had wide ranging and pervasive impacts on environmental justice. Um, and I'd like to show of hands, how many people have heard of redlining? Okay, that's quite a few of you. Um, how many people have heard of redlining say five to seven years ago? A few of you, okay. Um, I recently, in the last three years, um, was testifying for the Colorado Environmental Justice Act and uh, there were several legislators in the room who came up afterward and said, this is the first time I've heard about this redlining policy. Um, that is a failure of our educational system, right? I learned about redlining as a recent adult, like I, I very, very recently within the last 10 years for sure. And the, um, as, as we'll kind of talk about, the pervasive ways in which this shapes modern life um, make it, I think, essential knowledge for all of us, um, particularly those of us in fields of health and medicine. So I'm going to talk to you, even though for many of you have heard of redlining, I think many of us don't fully grasp what that policy entailed and how explicitly race and racism were baked into this redlining policy. So redlining was a policy um, between 1935 and 1940. Um, in which the Federal Homeowners Lo Loan Corporation rated the mortgage security, so how safe it was to lend money um, to people, individuals, corporations who were buying property in certain areas. And so this rating system rated um, areas of these major cities um, according to this scale. So A is green, there's a low risk this is a great place to invest. D was red, hazardous. Um, so lenders would be discouraged from, from making loans to people in those areas. So the information used to rate different neighborhoods included some things that maybe we think would be legitimate, like the quality of housing there 
or the recent sales of homes in that area. However, it also included factors that I think we can look at today and pretty objectively say should not be a part of these calculations. Um, and that includes um, the presence of environmental hazards and very importantly, the racial and ethnic identity of the residents living in these areas. Um, there's a very cool project called, um, if you Google mapping inequality, you can find these maps. They've digitized all of the original redlining maps, as well as, and this is really where I think we can gain some insights in deeper insights into this policy. You are not gonna be able to read it right here, but this is the actual form that an assessor would use to say, here's what I see in this, in this neighborhood and here's why I'm making the determination that this area should be rated green, yellow, red, et cetera, okay? And so I'll zoom in on a couple of things here just so you can actually see what the fields are on this form. And again, you're gonna have a hard time reading this, but it says things like, what is the percentage of, um, what's the composition of the area? Um, are there foreign born people? Are there Negroes in this area, right? Those are explicit things that the, the, the assessor had to fill out and say yes or no to. And those are like legitimately the things that, that made up the, um, the calculation here. So uh, this is, so what I've got uh, highlighted here is the Park Hill neighborhood. So really close by here in Denver. And I'll read some of these clarifying remarks that tell you why this area was rated green. Okay, this is the newer part of the Choice Park Hill section. Um, it is uh, an area of um, well artistically landscaped. Um, it's built up on both sides with a better class of homes. Um, the houses were built uh, um, 20 to 25 years ago, they maintained their character of exclusiveness and desirability, okay? The fact that the area is Park Hill adds to its desirability. All right, so this is, and, and as we saw before with the, um, you know, the, there are uh, no, very few foreign born, no Negroes in this area. So this area is rated green, okay? Now we're gonna take a short little um, jaunt over to the Whittier neighborhood. Um, the Whittier neighborhood was rated D. Um, the, the demographic information here shows that there are um, some foreign born, a mixture of folks, and, uh, and yes, there are Negro people living in this area. Infiltration of Negroes is actually, again, on the form, okay? This isn't subtle. This isn't an accident. This is intentional. I will also read this explanation of why this area was rated green. This is a better Negro section of Denver, and it is one of the best color districts in the United States. The northeastern part of it is often referred to as the Negro Country Club. It is an old brick section with a reasonably large number of well-kept newer homes, mostly occupied by Negroes. It is not a typical Negro area of cheap, tumble-down, ill-kept shacks found in eastern and midwestern cities, but all of the colored occupants are housed in brick structures, either detached or in terraces. For a Negro section, it is well kept up. Were it not for the heavy colored population, much of it could be rated C. Okay? So this is what we're dealing with. This is a very explicitly racist policy. We'll look at a couple more Denver neighborhoods real quick because they're the ones that we're gonna be talking a little bit more about later on. This is the Globeville neighborhood. Um, the majority are foreign born or of South European descent. Um, Hungarians, Poles, and Bulgarians rated D. This is uh, Swansea. Here we go. Uh, no, this way. There we go. Um, this is Swansea, the Swansea, uh, Elyria Swansea neighborhood. This is an area occupied entirely by industrial workers from the packing plants, stockyards, and other plants nearby. Wide range and variety of homes. Um, Demand for homes is entirely by wage earners of the low income brackets who do not mind the stench from the stockyard districts. Do we think the assessors were going around and asking the people who lived in this area if they minded the stench? And I want you to think about this as I am telling you more about the North Denver neighborhoods today, because are we making the same assumptions? Are we continuing to assume that the people who live in North Denver don't mind the stench from Suncor and the wastewater treatment plant and the landfills 
that are in their neighborhood. I think we might be making those same assumptions and making policy based on that. Okay, so redlining, officially this policy, right, I told you it ended in the 1940s and the, the Fair Housing Act was passed in the 1960s that uh, at which kind of banned a lot of the practices of using race in these types of decisions, right? So good, we fixed the problem. Well, not quite, because the problem is that one of the, the, the legacy of this policy continues today and one of the clearest and most pervasive impacts is on home ownership rates and generational wealth. <clears throat> So since people in the D neighborhoods, which were disproportionately people of color, had a harder time getting mortgage loans, they were less likely to buy homes and accumulate less wealth over time. And again, we continue to see this very large gap uh, in the United States between homeownership weight, uh, rates and wealth levels um, between white and black families. Um, in addition, the, while re, uh, explicitly uh, racist redlining policies were outlawed, they were replaced by a lot of race neutral policies like exclusionary zoning, policies that say that only single family homes can be built in certain neighborhoods, especially um, in those green lined areas. So this perpetuates the segregation and exclusion of redlining um, and their impacts, um, if not in their stated intent, the impact of those policies continue. And so again, if we look at those three neighborhoods that I highlighted or three of the neighborhoods I highlighted, um, Park Hill continues to be um, majority white, only 22% non-white and 82% of people who live in that area are, are owning homes um, versus Globeville where it's 67% non-white and 45% homeowners and Whittier, 47% on white and 57% homeowners, okay? And Whittier actually, you know, all of these have complicated stories. We've had recent gentrification, right? That's changing the composition of a lot of these areas. Um, but, uh, but again, I think that signal is still quite clear. Um, and uh, so yeah, these exclusionary zoning policies, uh, you know, are continuing to, to kind of be a part of that. So these are, uh, the red line areas have the lowest rates of single family zoning today, uh, which means that they continue to be sort of areas where lower income people and communities of color are concentrated. So some other impacts we see, um, there's work that colleagues at CU Denver have done showing how um, the location of parks and green space follows these uh, redlining um, kind of patterns. So we kind of see right in this Denver map, we've got uh, this, um, sort of uh, inverse L kind of shape and the, the neighborhoods on sort of the outside of that L um, continue to have access to uh, fewer trees, for example, also have hotter surface temperatures. Um, and, um, and there also were signals and some really good work uh, looking at COVID rates during the pandemic. And again, showing um, very high rates in neighborhoods like Val Verde and West Denver um, that have, uh, that were also formerly redlined areas. So now we're gonna kind of take a closer look at North Denver and we're gonna come back to some of the, the things that you learned um, or got a glimpse of during the quiz that we took at the beginning of class. So this is work that comes out of a project we call the Reciprocity Project. And the purpose of this project is to try and shift away from a purely dam damage-centered approach to talking about environmental justice to one that focuses on the roles of all of our different communities in both perpetuating damage, but also working towards more just outcomes. We wanna acknowledge community power and agency and leadership in building resilience and fighting for more justice. We also want to work, think about um, how we can build more reciprocal relationships, okay? So as we're gonna talk about today, our relationships often now are givers and takers, right? And, and many of us who live in more privileged neighborhoods are the takers, right? We are taking resources and um, goods and value, and we are leaving the, the communities like North Denver to bear the cost of those actions, right? So, um, how could we design societies that have more reciprocal relationships where we're distributing the cost and the benefits of these different um, activities uh, more fairly um, across society? So I'm gonna highlight a couple of things that we've produced as a team. Um, you all, again, um, took the uh, version, actually sort of a condensed version of our relationship quiz. 
Um, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our relation, our, um, our North Denver report. And I want to say again that this work was done collaboratively um, with Green Latinos here in, in the Denver area. We also have collaborated with um, Northeastern University. So the idea for this relationship quiz actually originated in a student project that one of my colleagues um, was, was sort of uh, uh, spearheading or, or in, for one of her classes um, where students were working with an organization in the Chelsea area outside of Boston, um, organization called Green Roots and developed this sort of concept of, you know, what does Chelsea, what does Chelsea Creek do for you? And so we built on that concept, partnered with them, found our local partner, um, Ian Tafoya of Green Latinos um, is a powerhouse a uh, major environmental justice leader here in Colorado, and he's been our close collaborator on all of this work. So over the course of um, a couple of years together, um, actually about a year, we wrote, um, collaborative, wrote collaborative, collaboratively wrote um, this report. And so the purpose of this report was to, again, highlight how we all play a role in this environmental justice story and to really put to the fore the kind of a uh, compendium of all of the goods and services um, that North Denver was providing and how that impacts local communities, okay? Um, and I wanna highlight again that we did this work, so I have to acknowledge my amazing um, lab group and team, um, Carla Nyquist and Stephanie Pease, um, Ruth um, McConan is an undergrad at CU Denver who worked on this with us as well, um, and a major group effort to chase down all this information, which should be a lot more accessible than it is, um, and we'll talk about that. But, uh, you know, really a lot of work going into kind of gathering the information for this report, working again collaboratively hand in hand with Green Latinos and Ian Tafoya. Um, and then we also had support from um, Wild Earth Guardians on the production and um, translated this into Spanish for, uh, through the, the community language co-op. Um, to Because again, like this, you know, we want to make sure that language justice is a part of this work as well. So the, some of the key findings, um, first of all, you know, the, the work that we found, or the, um, let's see, did I skip over a slide? No, I think I'm on the right one here. So this is work, uh, what we found is that there's a lot of different um, impacts on, on the communities. So for example, um, you know, as I mentioned, right, we have the legacy of redlining, which translates into different zoning practices. And in fact, in these areas, the zoning almost exclusively throughout a lot of this land is for industrial uses, right? So that means that businesses can, can kind of do what they want, uh, you know, in compliance with, in, in theory, in compliance with, uh, with environmental regulations. Um, but, but th those uses are prioritized over the community's wants and needs. Um, speaking of compliance, we also found that in this fairly small geographic area, there are 183 facilities that have violated at least one EPA law um, over the past three years. Okay, and some of those are in serious compliance. Some of them um, have failed to report, uh, which we think is also very important because again, access to this information about what's going on is also something that the communities have a right to know um, and, um, and that we all have, should, should have access to. Um, so, you know, we look at the burdens across all these different sectors. So um, pollution from, um, from power industries. So Suncor, again, is sort of the 800 pound gorilla in this space, um, a pretty egregious violator of um, many permits. And it actually operated under an expired permit for several years um, and was just allowed to keep, you know, doing what it was doing, saying our permits in process. Um, there's now lawsuits undergoing about the, the um, about its, its most recently approved permit. Um, so if we know this area, there's also three highways, right? So there's road traffic. Um, there's a lot of production facilities, which is driving a lot of that traffic. Uh, and um, the Nestle Purina food, uh, pet food factory is there, right? So like many of us, if we've driven through that area, might have smelled that, the, the odors from, from that. Um, if we keep going, uh, you know, we've got, uh, again, the, yeah, the highways, so lots of uh, freight, uh, rail, uh, rail and car traffic. 
um, and, uh, and then also several waste management facilities um, in this area. So, you know, what we think this really documents is this cumulative set of exposures that communities are facing. It's not just one thing, it's a whole bunch of different things. And our regulations actually aren't set up very well for, for that. There's a lot of work right now to kind of think about how can we regulate differently? Because at this point we have kind of Clean, clean Air Act um, regulations that say, okay, you can, you know, each facility can emit so much of, you know, each specified pollutant. Um, and then also there's Clean Water Act and each of those kind of are facility by facility. So they're not set up very well to say, we've got uh, 2,000 to 8,000 businesses in this area. How do we deal with the cumulative burden that they're all putting out together and use that in our permitting and, um, and enforcement decisions? And so there's work that's happening in that area, um, but I think this really shows the, the strong need for that. Going back to what we were looking at before, right, I think it's very clear that the fact that these all these interconnected sectors exist in this relatively small geographic area, um, you know, again, isn't an accident. It is the result of explicit policies that have, have got us to that point. Um, and again, the thing that we really want to highlight is that the benefits, right, there are benefits. People are, are having jobs. We are, um, you know, getting our Amazon, Amazon packages delivered to us, right? But a lot of those benefits are going outside of the community while the costs are very localized. Um, we also find, and this is actually, I think my next slide here, that there's a lot that we don't know. And so this is, again, where our, um, our group has really highlighted this data justice component to this. So for all of these things, right, we think it's very clear that communities should know, for example, how many trains are traveling through their, their area and what those trains are carrying, right? We have some very clear examples of what happens when a train derails and um, and communities are, are affected, right? And so if communities are gonna be a part of making decisions about rail safety and what those protocols should be, et cetera, they have a right to access to that information. That information currently is entirely pri pr proprietary. The state even has very limited information to that right now. Um, we had, again, intrepid students calling up people and kind of having like off the record conversations to learn the little bit that we were able to include in this report about, about that, tra that rail traffic. And so, you know, uh, there's also a lot of self, a lot of the data on um, emissions comes from self-reported sources, right? And so there's not a whole lot of verification. So we think that this, um, that there are major concerns that we had, um, again, as a, you know, pretty, pretty, um, resourceful group of uh, well-educated folks trying to find access to this data and having roadblock after roadblock, right? We don't think that this, this um, information is available to communities in the ways and the, the formats that it needs to be um, to support real inclusion and participation in those key decisions. Um, I also, again, I mentioned that um, Ruth McConan has been working with us um, and she built a, a story map that goes with our report. So trying to communicate our information in various different ways. Um, and so this is a sort of encapsulation of the report in a story map version. So you can actually click through, get a lot of the same information. Um, uh, one thing that has been interesting is, you know, when we or originally wrote our report, we said, you know, Ian, you know, this is a pretty dense report. Should we like, you know, shorten it up so that people can actually like digest it? And he was like, sure, go ahead and build a story map. But I actually really like having this big thick document that I can drop onto regulators desks and say, what are you gonna do about, hey, read the appendix at the end where I list 183 facilities that have violated these EPA permits. And so actually having that thick, thick and comprehensive document was something that he was really, um, uh, adamant that we that we retain. Um, and speaking of that, you know, the, he's also uh, very savvy in, in um, uh, working with the media. So we've had several news stories uh, when we, we did a couple of community launch events where we um, put out the report and highlighted findings. And, um, and Ian has continued, and, you know, Ian and, and his um, uh, 
colleagues, um, kind of other coalition members have used this report pretty extensively in advocating. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, the EPA, for example, is now becoming much more serious about, um, for example, prioritizing enforcement actions in disproportionately impacted communities. And so this has been a tool to say, yes, that is absolutely what's needed. And here, here's a head start for you, some of the places that you might think about, about um, starting. And one of the, the key quotes here is, is you know, um, Ian has said, this is being finally being covered like the scandal that it is. So, so the, you know, the work that we've done has helped to kind of um, bring that to the fore. So now we're gonna come back to talking about all of you, okay, all of us. Um, and I think, you know, when we think about what our role is when it comes to environmental justice, some of the tools and the narratives that we have at our disposal don't put us in that story very cleanly. And one of the things um, that, that I'd highlight is, you know, some of these existing tools. So this is from the EPA's EJ screen map, right? Um, so this is the same map of, uh, a map of Denver that shows, in this case, an index that shows um, air toxics cancer risk, all right? Um, and, and actually, I think it's an index that combines air toxics cancer risk and the demographics of the population. And so this is highlighting kind of where we have a heightened risk and, you know, coinciding with communities of color and low-income communities. So this map is probably going to look pretty familiar. It's got a similar pattern to those ones that we looked at before, right? The redlining maps and their legacy kind of things, right? So it's telling us that story, but what it's what it's kind of telling us, right, is we're looking at this map and we're saying, oh, our eye is really drawn to this bright red blob, which is North Denver, okay? So, hey, environmental justice problem over here. However, this map is also saying down here, in Inglewood, Cherry Hills, you guys are great. Doing a great job, keep it up, right? And so all of that story that we've been trying to tell with our report, where it's actually the consumption patterns, right, of folks here that are heaping those burdens on folks over here, or, or let's not even say that it's really my personal consumption choices, right? It's the policies that have allowed me to live in an area. I actually live in Louisville, closer to Boulder, um, but my area also shows up as um, gray on a map like this, right? So, you know, that's that's telling me that I don't have anything to do with this. This isn't my problem. Maybe out of charity, out of the good of my heart, I should go to North Denver and work with them and see if we can find some solutions, right? I can go help them fix the problems, but it's not really my problem. And we think that that is a very false story. So that is the purpose of the quiz that you took, is to try and have some inroads into telling a different story that puts each of us into this conversation. Um, and so, you know, we want to look at how each of us are connected to North Denver, what roles that we are playing in this context. Um, and so, you know, try, trying to kind of, again, build this story that these relationships among communities are at the heart of inequitable outcomes and that changing the structure of those relationships so they're more reciprocal is key to achieving environmental justice. All right, so let's talk more specifically about what you can do, okay? If you are part of the environmental justice story because we live in a society that is allowing you to benefit while other people are harmed, right? Um, or, right, I'm not, I shouldn't assume, right? Like everyone here is some part of that story. If you are in a community that is disproportionately impacted, you have a right to have people who are living in less impacted areas show up and be a part of those solutions. So the good news here is that it's not up to any one of us, right? Um, I know I'm talking to a lot of, of doctors and, and, and uh, aspiring doctors who, um, you know, I'm not that kind of doctor, but also a doctor, and we like to fix things, right? We like to be the heroes. We don't have to be the heroes here. The heroes are already out there, and I'm um, make sure this exists. Okay. I'll show you a clip here. This is, I moved here with like my kids at that park right behind. I was like, oh, that's so awesome. There's my kids are gonna have a park right behind, right behind them, and I didn't know I was actually killing them. It's one of the most polluted area codes in the nation. My son was having bloody noses. My daughter has the migraines, and and my mom got sick on me, and I got sick these things that we smell every day and every night and every morning. 
That's what's making us sick. A lot of people's like, why don't we just move? Well, we can't afford to move one. We end up in places like Commerce City because they push us out of these gentrified areas and we move up where it's cheaper to live. There is regular people doing the work yeah. for this election. Hey, neighbor, did you vote already? Si votó? After 100 years of environmental racism and environmental injustices, this, this community's fed up. We're, we're done. You know, I think right now we're, we're waking up. Because I'm not alone. No estoy sola. I want to let my leaders know that. I want to let all the polluters know that. That I'm not alone anymore, okay? No estoy sola. We have a lot of parties, right? We class that there's a lot of Latinos here. We love to party. Sometimes we get out of hand, you know? They put the music, the banda is getting down at 3 o'clock in the morning. The neighbor's like, knock, knock. Hey, you, can you guys turn it down? And the neighbor turns it up. I mean, what kind of neighbor is that? This is what they're doing. Right? Every time they have an opportunity, they want to pollute more. They want to kill us some more. That, that's not a good neighbor. You know, good neighbor's like, okay, I, I hear you. I'm going to turn it down or I'm going to just turn it off. We have no choice to transition into the future because of the climate crisis we're facing. The world is shifting. When that takes place, our community, again, for a second time, third time, fourth time, we're going to be left behind because of industries like this. We, we don't want to be left behind dying here because these people choose to be greedy and continue to bank on our misery. You know, no. Results. Commerce City, World One. I got butterflies. <laughs> I got butterflies. Oh my God. So that's Lucy Molina. Um, she is a Commerce City resident. Um, I won't spoil the outcome of, of the movie. That, the, that, so that, that documentary, A Good Neighbor, is actually showing in local theaters currently. Um, you can look it up, just Google A Good Neighbor, Commerce City, and you'll find, find the, um, the website for it. Um, but she is a tireless, again, advocate, um, champion uh, for, for this work. And you know, it's really important to highlight that these communities are, are continuing to fight and that they're winning. So I mentioned earlier that um, I was able to, to be part of a coalition in, 19, or in uh, 2021 that passed Colorado's Environmental Justice Act. That's um, shown uh, up here. Um, in 2022, this coalition, actually, you can see Ian and, um, and Lucy, if you zoom in here at the bill signing for the air toxics bill, um, which is, again, really focused on addressing um, some of the injustices that we're seeing. Uh, I mentioned that there's some um, ongoing lawsuits. So Colorado uh, kind of eventually approved a Sun Corps permit. I told you that it wasn't, they uh, operated without a permit for a while. The federal EPA has come back and said, you know what, this is not up to par. You need to do this over. Um, so, so there's more enforcement, better enforcement of regulations that's coming, again, because of the community activism and um, attention that's been drawn to these issues. Um, and I wanted to highlight, too, um, I've been very honored to be nominated for a 2023 Women in Environmental Justice Awards. There's an award ceremony at the go governor's um, mansion next week, so that's great. I'm very honored to be a part of that group, but really what's been incredibly inspiring is reading the bios of Beatrice Soto and um, Shana Oliver, and there's Lucy again in here, right? Folks that are that are doing this work. I was nominated in a research category. Um, Rebecca Curry is doing amazing legal work at Earth Justice for this. So none of us are alone. None of us are doing this work alone. And so when we're thinking about what you can do, right? We really want that grounded in this social eco ecological model you might have seen. Um, which is looking at sort of how we operate to combat structural racism at all of these different levels. And so I think, again, the key is that these problems that we're looking at were created by policy. And so thinking that any of our individual actions, you know, just changing our consumption behavior at the margin is going to change this 
is not going to work. We need to be doing things at all of these different levels. Um, so working at all across all these different scales. So let's get specific, right? Um, what are some things that you can do? Well, sure. Start some things that you start with with the individual level, right? Those are some low hanging fruits. You can educate yourself. This is my absolute favorite book in the world, The Sum of Us: um, What Racism Costs um, Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. Um, diversify your media, right? Um, listen to other voices. Go see a good neighbor. Learn about that. And sure, go ahead and recycle, right? That's a it's a fine thing to do. We just don't want everyone kind of walking away with this, being like, "All right, good, I." Uh, you know, I've got my own electric vehicle, so now my, my job is done. We got to keep going. So let's go up to the, the interpersonal level. Um, we want to, um, you know, again, for some things that, that you might be able to do in, in your profession, right? Listen to your patients and validate their concerns. What do you say to Lucy when she is in your office and telling you that she is having, her daughter is having migraines, her son is having nosebleeds, right? What do you tell her? Do you say... Well, the science says that everyone is, you know, the there haven't been any serious violations in the last, you know, X time. So I don't know what you're talking about. Or, you know, are you telling her, you know, are you sure that you're eating well and exercising? Right? Like, okay, but listen to those broader that broader context that is determining Lucy's chances to be as healthy as she can be. Um, check your own biases and, um, you know, really acknowledge right those social determinants of, ter determinants of health that Lucy and her, her um, neighbors are dealing with. Um, at the institutional level, you know, thinking about how you can do work, engaging with community partners, again, seeing that as a partnership, not as a one way, you know, you've got the knowledge and they better listen. Um, and then thinking about, you know, within the institution, within CU Anschutz, what are some practices, right? How can we look at this as a, uh, I have a link, oops, um, a link to a, a YouTube video here, kind of thinking about what are some practices of the medicine that maybe can help you, you know, check when you are prescribing a medication that is a, you know, maybe not the first line medication to a patient of color. Just check that for a second. Is there a reason for that? Um, when you're assessing pain, are you, you know, maybe, you know, internalizing some of the biases that tell us that black people don't experience pain the same way that white people do. That's false, right? Let's dismantle those things and put in structures so that we're putting in checks for all of us to examine those biases. Um, at the policy level, um, you know, there are a lot of things we can do. We can give time and money to the organizations that are doing that work. Again, we don't have to make up the answers. They're already out there. So connect with the people who are leading that work. Um, show up and testify. Again, I love to talk to people about how to do that. Um, it's it's very um, easy and, and it's really appreciated, right? When you've got that MD or that PhD after your name, your voice carries weight. That is the structure of our society currently. So how are you going to use that? Um, know your representatives, reach out to them, form relationships, let them know what matters to you, what you're hearing from the communities that you serve. And finally, you know, in this policy realm too, I think some of us are very good at advocating and sometimes our advocacy does a really good job of trying to protect our own communities, okay? So if we've got a, a compost facility that is gonna be sited in our neighborhood or a, um, uh, a distribution, a warehouse facility that's going to be doing a distribution, we might be really good at rallying our community and saying, we don't want that near us, right? But are we also showing up to protest the impacts of our own consumption on our neighbor communities, right? So, so really thinking about that, affordable housing is the other huge elephant in this room, okay? Um, many communities that are, you know, ostensibly liberal and say we're for justice are also pretty quick to step up and say mm, more traffic, you know, more crime when affordable housing developments are proposed. So finally, I just want to kind of end by saying that, you know, in this work, this, this area of culture, you know, kind of gave me a little bit of pause and like, what do we do at that cultural level? And I think what I really want to highlight there is that a clear lesson that I've gotten in working with this is that the partners that I work with are not just tireless advocates and exhausted at times. They are also incredibly hopeful and resilient. And if Lucy can express hope and think that we're making some good progress, 
then where on earth do I, you know, find the basis to turn away and say, this is hopeless. I'm just going to go back to, you know, my safe little bubble and not be a part of this, this fight. Um, so I think it's important. I think it's really um, key for us to realize that that narrative of hopelessness and, um, you know, we can talk about climate defeatism sometimes. So, you know, I haven't talked a lot about climate change today, but I think we all kind of understand that a lot of the reason that we have not acted on a problem as clear and pressing as climate change is because large corporations, similar to smoking, right, have deployed similar strategies to say, nope, nothing to see here, there's nothing happening. And that is shifting, right? But a lot of times now the shift is, oh, it actually is happening, but it's too late, we can't do anything about it. Or you as an individual can't do anything about it, right? And so that defeatism, right, we can't do anything about this, is also part of the strategy that keeps us from making progress. So this culture of, no, nope, I'm not going to hear that. There is progress that's being made, and we can choose as a society a different path. We can choose reciprocity. We can choose this radical active hope and partnership um, to build a, a better and more just society. Dr. Dickinson, thank you very much. I will throw it open to the room for questions to get us started. Hi, thank you. Great discussion. I'm just wondering, you kind of spoke to this a little bit, but I'm wondering if you have any plans in your lab or ideas to address that like NIMBY or the not mm. in my backyard. This is such a great question. Um, and actually, you know, I think it's what, what launched me on this path at the beginning was that desire. So that's that's kind of the, the impetus of this quiz is to, to really get people examining sort of their own, um, you know, complicitness and then how does that affect the actions that you're taking? Um, so, uh, yeah, just a, a kind of short backstory is that the quiz was really the focus of our efforts at the beginning. And then as we started working with Ian, he said, okay, that's great. The quiz is, is fine. I really need this report so that I can put that on legislators' desks and, and really make progress that way. And so we took a lot, we, we kind of pivoted um, in the way that we're supposed to do, right, when we're working with community partners. And so I think there's been a lot of discussion. We've started testing this quiz a little bit. We've done some sort of pilot testing to see if this starts shifting people's um, views and values. Um, a couple of those, those news pieces that come up, you know, when, when we're seeing news coverage of a community that's mobilizing against sort of one of these Lulu's locally undesirable land uses. Um, we've, we've kind of started formulating some plans around, okay, how could we go you know, maybe to that area and, and start, you know, using this quiz there. Because again, it's not, I'm not saying necessarily that that warehouse is a good project and should go forward, right? I, I haven't looked at it closely enough to say yes or no on that. What I'm saying though, is that if we cared equally about the impacts of our, you know, our consumption, our actions, no matter where they were located, right? we would l live in a different society. And that's one of the things that we highlight in the in the quiz. I know that I didn't give you a lot of time, but for example, there's this waste um, treatment facility in Seattle that's built right in the middle of the city underground and it's generating um, energy for the city. And it's like, it's right there. People live right next to it and it's, and it's, it's okay, right? And so there are different ways to do things. I think there's also this narrative that like has to go somewhere. Well, does it, right? Or could we consume less, right? Have less trash to begin with, for example. Um, have more closed loop systems. And I think, again, if I, I do this like kind of thought experiment sometimes, like if everything that I threw out, actually I do this thought experiment, but also I spent the spring semester in Rwanda and it kind of is this experiment, like the trash that I produce, right? Just goes into a pile in my neighborhood. And so if I'm, if I'm living that reality, I think the choices that we make as a society about, you know, how big that pile can get, we've got to find a solution to that, right? And our solution has just been, okay, we'll just keep putting it there and, and making that pile bigger and finding a new new place to put a pile. So yes, it's a high priority. Don't have clear plans yet, but would love to keep working on that and would love to engage partners on how to, how to think about that. 
Dr. Ernest. Thank you for a, a interesting and provocative talk. I'm, um, this idea just popped in my head, which may be totally unrealistic, but Rawls and his sort of formulation of justice would, if you make a just decision, you do it behind a curtain of ignorance, yeah. um, which makes me think that if, if we did our permitting um, uh, on with a lottery basis, so, so we're going to make a judgment about how we permit something, yeah. and then we will draw lots to say what zone it then goes in. I wonder if we wouldn't make very different decisions. That's, uh, I love that. I, I haven't thought about Rawls in a long time, but um, but that is a perfect, I think a, a, a perfect um, thought experiment and way of thinking, and, and not just thought experiment, right? Like really, I think that's what we need is um, these, these uh, proposals on what would be a more just way of doing this? And of course, like, you know, with that, you might actually want to take some of these overburdened areas, uh, areas I, I think you probably would want to take those out of that lottery, right? Because they've had enough. Um, but, but yes, I think that is, that is this, you know, what if we didn't know where you were going to land in society, what zip code you were going to be born into, right? What zip code your child was going to be born into? What decisions would we make about how the world looked? I think it would be very, very different. Uh, Dr. Zare. I had a question about uh, there's a recent court case in Montana where a group of uh, youth presented by like a uh, um, law office came, brought a case and I think was um, decided in their favor. I think largely because of the constitution of Montana. Does that change the blueprint at all of how we can kind of approach this in Colorado specifically? Yeah, absolutely. So I know what you're talking about. There were, uh, and I don't have all the details memorized, but yes, a group of youth in Montana had a court, the, I think the Montana Supreme Court rule in their favor that they, um, that the impacts of climate change had to be considered in these kinds of permitting decisions, right? In the decisions that, that are being made. So those are uh, a valid um, category of, of damages um, that, that could be uh, undertaken. Yes, I think that is absolutely, um, uh, you know, could be a game changer. Of course, it's going to be challenged and who knows where it'll go, but that there, there, you know, that's not a one-off. There are increasingly sort of these, um, you know, similar types of efforts. And I do think that the, the legal system, again, that's something that I've really seen um, here in Colorado. So I mentioned, you know, the EPA has sued Colorado over its Suncor permit, um, but also uh, some community groups, including Green Latinos, have just sued the state of Colorado um, over some, some broader sort of air quality rules. And, um, and so I think, you know, using the, the court system and, and really this rights-based framework of, you know, how are we justifying treating some communities so differently from others? And how are we justifying kind of keeping a blind eye to a large um, set of the consequences of the actions that we're, that we're taking? Hi, um, thank you for your presentation. It was really um, beautifully put together. This is probably going to be more than a, a two minute uh, discussion, but my question for you is, um, you know, there's a lot of talk of community engagement in sort of our solutions to some of these problems and a huge part of community engagement is being present. And I wonder how, how we balance gentrification mm -hmm. in these kind of discussions about moving certain things out of communities and bringing other things in. Yeah. So I think what your question is kind of asking is a couple of different things. So, so one is about, <clears throat> I guess maybe, maybe the way that I would rephrase it is when we're engaging community in research and discussions and policy decisions, right? Who has standing to be a part of that discussion? Is it only the people who currently live in the neighborhood right now today or not? And I think one of the ways actually um, another kind of piece of my background, like I said, I'm from Louisville, and so I've done work on the Marshall Fire um, and our recovery from that and kind of who's at the table and who isn't. And one of the things, yeah, that's been really clear for us is that, um, for example, you know, renters are much more likely currently to have been displaced and not be in those communities anymore. 
And so when we're making decisions, for example, about how much affordable housing to include as we rebuild, right? There are some people that are showing up and saying, we don't want affordable housing. Like, let us get back into our homes that we own um, before we make some massive decisions about, you know, building new affordable housing projects. Well, that's the voices of people that currently live in or, you know, are showing up to those discussions. It's not including the people who maybe were displaced, right, and are no longer in the communities or would love to live in the communities who work in our communities and can't afford to live there, right? So I think that's kind of part of the community engagement paradigm has to be who are the interested and affected groups for a decision and then not limiting that to just okay, well, it's just the people who live here, right? So we need to think about, and, and some of these groups are harder to, right? Like, okay, so potential renters who would want to live here, that's going to be a harder group to kind of define and access, but we've got to try. Um, and there are a lot of community organizations, right, who do have those ties, who know people who used to live here, whose families were here and who live somewhere else. So I think, again, working in partnership with the groups that are there can help us to both figure out who should be at the table and how to get them there. It's right at one o'clock. So thank you everyone for being here today. Dr. Dickinson, thank you for that excellent talk. Thank you.